So it is my privilege to uh, be with colleagues, some of you looking older than the last time I saw you. Um, and some of us have been at this a while, haven't we? So uh, I, it really is a privilege to be with uh, colleagues, you know, who are uh, in the trenches together, trying to do the same thing, learning from each other uh, over time, uh, really uh, calling it a blessed fellowship that we can, we can do this work together. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful for that, and uh, thank you for my, Michael Didway, who's leading us at this point, but uh, even without the official position because of his dedication to the magazine ministry, uh, no matter where you've been, Michael, you even tried to give it away a time or two, and it just kept coming back to you. And uh, the Lord has really used the preaching magazine, I think, for a lot of us to keep saying what we need to hear. You have not been prideful in denomination and who you say, you know, we're going to only speak of or for these people. You make your, your net wide and all of us learn from each other. So you've been kind of a model of helping other people help other people. And I'm thankful for what you've done. Uh, let me ask that you would look in your Bibles at Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13, Jesus' public ministry well underway. He has made plain that he is the long prophesied Davidic king, and he has declared himself to be the king of the realms, physical, spiritual, eternal. All has been made plain. He is the king. But of course, the question comes, great, what, what, what kind of kingdom do you have? And you recognize Matthew 13 to be the compendium of parables of the kingdom as Jesus uses his way of making it plain. We don't have time for all the parables of Matthew 13, but there are key things giving us signposts of the nature of the kingdom. Matthew 13, verse 24, Jesus put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. So let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Father, this is your word, and so we would pray for your spirit to take it to our hearts. The same spirit that gave it makes it spring to life and do its work as you intend in our hearts. And because we know that you teach us to teach others, uh, work beyond my words to be the teacher of us all, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So you're going to know these headlines, not new in the news, but a little more bold lately. Iran's top general announces wiping Israel off the map is achievable. This nuclear power with whom we no longer have a treaty is announcing the rocket test and the capacity to annihilate another nation. And just politically, you know that beyond that particular purpose, there is havoc in the Middle East. There's the involvement of major nations. And America's world is particularly in jeopardy because of what Iran is willing to say and do. The commander of the Revolutionary Guard of Iran recently said of Israel... This sinister regime must be wiped off the map. And this is no longer a dream. This is now our achievable goal. So we get all the usual questions. 
Why doesn't the U.S. do something? Why doesn't Israel do something? Or just for the sake of world stability, why don't Iran's allies, why doesn't China do something? Why doesn't Russia do something? But of course, we are Christians, and so our question is, why doesn't God do something? First headline, wiping out Israel is achievable by Iran. Second headline comes in the form of a question. Where is the world's most rapidly growing church today? It is the underground church of Iran. Well, why doesn't the Lord just wipe it out? Because then the harvest would not be full. Because there is a process underway. There are sheep among the wolves, according to the Frontier Alliance International that records fast-growing church movements in the U.S. and in the nation, excuse me, in the nations of the world, and this is the most rapid-growing church. It's in Iran. You could multiply the examples. What nation of the world has more Christians than any other nation of the world? China. Well, that's our enemy. That's our competition. Why does the Lord just take out China, make life easier for us? Because then the harvest would not be full. Because there is a reason that the Lord is maintaining his purposes for even a weedy world so that he might fulfill his purposes in his time. And We need the big examples, maybe, to think about the parable of the weeds just in common terms. After all, in our fears and our tears, we look at our lives and our world and our sin and our enemies and our broken relationships and our disease. God, why don't you just stop it? Just just fix it. It's in your power. It's achievable for you. Why, Why don't you just kind of Take all the evil and just get it out of here. And God says to us, then I would rip up the wheat with the weeds. And I want the harvest to be full. And so we put on our gospel glasses wherever we are in the world. And we see the nature of the harvest. It is ripening. But it's not harvest time yet. And we recognize what God is doing. And we need that perspective to understand the nature of the kingdom of God as Christ is explaining it to his disciples in a way that must trouble them. You know, the Romans need to be gotten rid of. The Jewish establishment needs to be gotten rid of. Lord, just, it's achievable. You can do this. Boom, take care of it. And Jesus makes known the nature of the kingdom. First, it's ripening. I'm in the Midwest, and so it is the harvest time of year. And those of you who are from the farmlands, you recognize that doesn't mean it happens all at once. There are stages of the ripening. Um, if there's a series of parables that we, quite the, that we quote the most, I'm imagining that for most of us, the most quoted parable is going to be something like the prodigal son. Because it's so easy to describe the nature of the father there. Oh, the son was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to him and threw his arms around him. And the son said, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, put the ring on his finger, put the robe on him, put sandals on his feet. This, this son of mine was lost. He's found. He was dead and he's alive again. And we describe the nature of the heavenly Father. But here, Jesus is not describing the nature of the heavenly Father. He's defending the nature of the heavenly Father. And over and over again in the world in which I live, I find myself using this parable probably second to the parable of the prodigal son. Where so many people, why? Why? If there is a God in heaven, if there really is a kingdom Why? Iran and Syria and my cruel boss 
and my aching back and my abusive spouse and my rebellious child, why doesn't God just fix it? And we say, because the harvest is ripening and the harvest isn't here yet. And to take away all the things that create both need and opportunity for faith, to take them away just suddenly, would deny need and opportunity. And the harvest must come. And so because the harvest is ripening, the nature of the kingdom, not new to you who are theological here, is already and not yet. That's the nature of a ripening harvest. We, we live in the tension of the already and the not yet. Like the grain in the fields at harvest time, there are portions of the field that are ready and others uh, not yet. First the grain and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear. Or from the south, you know, first there's the nubbin and there's the tassel. Then there's the harvest. There are stages. And when we talk that way, we, we need the images. God has already planted his field. He's told us his standards. He's shown us his heart. He's given us his mission to take the salvation that he has provided into all the world. He's planted a field of of gospel goodness in this world that's sprouting up with men and women and boys and girls and all tribes and language and peoples and nations. And the, the wheat is springing up. But there's been an enemy. And there is evil in this world. And we want it to go away, but the harvest is not yet mature. Not all who should know and should understand yet know and do understand. And so the harvest is delayed even as the seeds are planted because we know that the the weeds come and they, they choke out the nourishment and the goodness of God and there are planted seeds of unbelief that are springing up everywhere and and we're like the servants, verse 28. Do do you want us to, to gather the weeds? They say to the master, you want us to pull them up? And he knows Jesus is actually saying, I know what your question is. God, why don't you pull up the weeds? And the answer is in verse 29. No, don't pull them up, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat. Let them both grow together until the harvest. So God lets everything ripen until the harvest time. That's Iran and China and India and Indonesia and a secularizing America. Because there's a great harvest ahead. Now, that doesn't mean it's all not yet. There are some things that are all ready. And we need both realities. Because what's happening at the cosmic level in terms of the already and the not yet is happening at the individual level, too, of our relationships and our occupations, and our bodies, and our families. God, my grandmother is struggling, so why don't you just take her home? Well, that can be a wonderful prayer of faith. God, just take her home. But God may know that there is a grandchild who needs her testimony, or a nurse who needs the testimony of the family as they care for and they're all tied to what God is doing for the larger harvest and there are young people God, why do I struggle so much with those at school that give me a hard time I didn't do anything to them why do you make me go through this I've heard that sermon about being blessed when others revile you and persecute you but this really hurts I'm So I, for 30 years, uh, ministered in the town where I went to high school. And is it interesting to, in your adulthood, meet the people who teased you for your Christianity uh, when you were a small kid and artistic in your junior high and high school, and, and see them reflect on those moments and wonder, 
and even rejoice at what God was doing in one's childhood, that you had no concept God was doing. And I think of a man that I'll tell you about in just a little bit. When I was crying out, God, fix it. Just make it stop. And God was doing something greater. I think of the testimony of those who were singing hymns to their torturers, even as we're here now. Of those who are imprisoned for their faith. I think of my student, Kenneth Bay, who you may remember the longest held American in a North Korean prison for his prayer ministry. And in his book of that occasion, talking about a conversation where one of the North Korean guards challenged him, if your God cares for you so much, why are you in prison? And Kenneth's response, what if God wants me to reach you by being in prison? What if there's a harvest and the wheat is growing among the weeds? And God is still doing his work. Is that a proper interpretation? Is that the way we should see all of this? That God is allowing the evil to create need in the human heart and at the same time creating opportunity until the harvest. Is that what this is all about? We don't have to really guess at that. We just have to keep reading verse 36. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So, Probably a pretty close interpretation <laughs> that there is need and opportunity being established until the harvest. But what, what, what do we take away from the tension of the already and the not yet? Certainly this, the weeds will not last forever. Evil may have its day. God will have the final say. Evil will not have the final victory. The weeds will not last. The challenge of evil, bigotry, and cruelty, and sin will be replaced by the glory of the kingdom and the goodness of the Lamb. That is a certainty. Right now, the weeds choke. But the gates of hell shall not prevail against the kingdom of God. They shall not succeed. The farmer will have his harvest, and the weeds of evil will not persist. What does that ultimate harvest look like when the weeds are burned in fire? We don't guess there either. The end of the book says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. There is a great harvest and there's a great feast when the harvest comes. And things are made new and they are made different when the kingdom is fully appearing before men. And that doesn't mean that we only wait for that reality to begin experiencing. The kingdom is already and not yet. And so some of us have a, have a friend who's, uh, whose son has struggled with Tourette syndrome. And I'm not the first to tell his story. He's told it in our own conference. 
So that when uh, Ben was traveling once on the preaching trip that lots of us go on, and uh, his wife was taking care of the children, the wife and the kids went to a restaurant, and the son Jason with the Tourette syndrome began to experience what sometimes happened, the, the twitches and the noises and the, the wrong expressions, so loud and uncontrollable. And so the mom gathered the daughters and Jason took them to the car, and as she was going, one of the daughters said to her mother, Mom, would Jason always be this way? And, and when Ben got home and and his wife told him that story. He said, what did you say? What did you say to her? And she said, well, Ben, will Jason always be this way? And, and she said, I, I didn't have anything to say. I hope with fatherly and husbandly compassion, he said, oh, yes, you did. Jason will not always be this way. There will come a time when there are no more fears, no more pain, no more tears, no more crying again. We will be made whole. All will be made right. I have a mentally disabled brother in prison. Dennis has been nice to keep track with me on that. And that is a man who has, because of Christ already and not yet, has become a believer in prison. And I think (laughs) it's so hard when the Weeds and the wheat grow together. But, but if God had taken the harvest earlier, there would never have come a time when I know my brother will be with Jesus and he will be more whole and right than he has ever been in this earthly existence. The harvest will be full. And who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And the one who conquers will have this heritage And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the weeds, the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Oh, it's horrible to hear. It is not the future of the wheat, which for the moment has need and opportunity put before it. Is what you're experiencing, is what you call happiness, is is the emptiness that you are living in and thinking it's fulfilling and satisfying, really so? Or is God not speaking to your heart of a deep and a profound need of something beyond yourself and your devices so that you may be part of a kingdom where there is no more pain or tears, where there is no darkness anymore, for all live in the light of the Lamb. But you want that, and here is the opportunity. Because what, what we know when we say the weeds will not last forever is that we are saying the hatred will be gone and the Alzheimer's will be gone and the oppression will be gone and the wheelchairs will be gone and the family tensions will be gone and my disappointments with my own self will be gone. I will live in the light of the Lamb. And that means, of course, that the best is yet to come. Not just the weeds will not last, but the best is yet to come. Now, you can't go to an old preacher's conference without the old preacher's tales coming up, and we all know the fork story, right? The lady who said to the preacher, you know, be sure you put a fork with me in the casket. Why? We all know, don't we? Because of the family gatherings, after the plates are collected, what does the host say? Keep your fork. Why keep your fork? Best is yet to come. So put a fork in the casket with me. Why? The best is yet to come. But that's just the not yet. What if we live that reality now? What if it is the already? That we are already seated in heavenly places. That that already the kingdom has come. That the fields are white unto the harvest because there is a harvest of souls already happening. That we can live in the reality of the truth that we know that is so certain. That though it is not yet, we, we live its truths already. I mentioned to you I, I had the misfortune and the fortune of ministering for 30 years in a town where I had also gone to high school. Which uh, means people remember you back then. <laughs> 
And uh, one of my friends in high school um, was an unlikely friend. Uh, he was a football hero, and I was a debate nerd. And uh, we were still friends. He was not a believer. That made it even more unlikely because as a football hero, he was kind of living the life and the sin that a football hero can live. So when I began to minister in that town as an adult, because we'd been in high school together, our children began to go to the same school at the same time. And they were roughly parallel ages. By then, uh, my friend had become a believer. I don't know exactly when. But that means I would preach in his church from time to time, even as his son would attend school with my son. But that's where the parallels differed. His, uh, his son and my oldest son entered kindergarten at the same time. But before they had entered first grade, my son, who had been a little slow in development, was gaining fast. And his son, who had been fast in development, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. So that the time my son and his son were in junior high, my son was beginning to excel in track. His son was confined to a wheelchair. By the time my son was in high school, he was winning national honors as a debate nerd. Um, his son could no longer talk. And by the second year of high school, my son, who was both running and speaking in speech competition, saw a great future ahead. And my friend's son could no longer see. One day, my son called his mother. Mom, there's been a miracle. Today, Robbie can run. And he can talk. He can see. Because today he went to be home with Jesus. Now, as the long-term friend of my high school football hero, even though I had pastored in that community, even though I preached in his church, even though our sons had been in school together, I must tell you, I feared going to give my condolences at the house, knocking on the door. Bill, I'm so sorry. Brian, don't you feel sorry for me? This is the best day of my life. My son has never been healthier. He's never been happier. He is whole, and he is safe at home with Jesus. He was living the reality of the already. The, the future already eroding into the present. And he was living the reality that the best is yet to come. But more than that, it's, it's here. We can, we can live in the, the fullness of the knowledge that that is our God who promises us that harvest. With all of its benefits and blessings. And when I know that. I understand the parables that follow. So, so good, so blessed is this tension of the kingdom that as hard as it is to live in the already and the not yet, it is, it is worth any sacrifice. If we truly understand it, we understand what Paul was saying, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us. But Jesus says it here, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. I don't know quite the ethics of that, but I get the point of it. I don't know what the treasure is. I don't know if it's gems or a vein of gold or... Pirates doubloons. I don't know what a doubloon is, but it sounds good. And what, what does he find? But whatever it is, it's, it's, it's so great that he's willing to sacrifice everything because he's got, 
He doesn't even have it fully in his possession, but he, he's, he's glimpsed it. He's touched it. It, it. Somehow its beauty has affected him, and he knows it's worth everything else. And, and when we get just the glimpse of the not yet and the already, we say, man, this is, this is worth everything. Um, I don't know how your church does it. Just this last Sunday, we always have a prayer time after the sermon. And... Um, some of you know I've had back issues, so I'm less and less mobile these days. So I didn't go to the back of the church. I stayed down front with the prayer team. And it was a Sunday where lots of people had come. And uh, I was pretty much done. The line had ended, and, and uh, there was a man who kind of hung back. And I'd not seen him before. And uh, he started forward, and then hesitated. I looked at him, and, and then I recognized him. I'd not seen him in years different in appearance and uh, now. But this man had awfully betrayed me and my family at an earlier stage of life. And he, he had stayed through that whole service and listened to a sermon and then come forward to talk to me. And I don't even know how to tell you that part of it is just because I do it instinctively now, but I just, I just went to him and threw my arms around him and hugged him. And he wept. And I thought for a moment, goodness, if I just thought a few minutes, I would not have hugged this man. <laughs> um, but God has done something in me that as God has forgiven me, so he's done something in my heart that I actually delight to hug a man who hurt me and my family terribly. If that's what Christ is like toward me, this is something beautiful. Now, I'm enough of a sinner that I will tell you, it, a few hours later, I'm mad at the guy again. But Jesus is not mad at me. And if I know that deeply, then I say, this is, this is a treasure. And I, I don't fully know it yet. But I get taste of it now and then. And I say, it's... It's more precious than, than anything. This is so good that my God would change me and forgive me and help me and not just me, but a, a world about me where the weeds are in everybody's heart. So much so that in verse 45 through 46, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven again is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, Went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus' kingdom is ripening. And as it's happening, he's providing for the weeds to grow a while. And we hate that. And does it teach you that you don't want to live in the weeds? I so value wheat. And when I learn, God, I need better than this, what I'm doing, who I am, what my heart instinctively wants to do, and how you've got to overcome my own sin, even yet, to teach me who you are, man, do I need you. And do other people need you? And we have the great opportunity of knowing we're part of being the wheat. And some of the people who are weeds are being conformed to wheat by what we are doing. And that's a huge blessing. Just last week, I was returning from a preaching trip. So late Saturday night, like some of you, I'm getting into our, my hometown. I'm going to preach Sunday morning. And uh, so as I got into the airport and kind of walked down the concourse, uh, there were bands playing. And there were banners and there were crowds and people with, you know, TV lights and bagpipes going. And, and man, this is really great. And it wasn't for me. Um, you know, there was one of the honor flights with uh, veterans who were coming back from Washington, uh, D.C. So I kind of walked through the crowd. And then as the veterans began to began to come down the concourse, most of them Vietnam-era uh, veterans. 
many in wheelchairs. Um, you know, I, I just kind of got in the crowd and turned around and watched as people high-fived and congratulated and welcomed and cheered. And, and then when I got home, it was, it was on the news. And the commentator said, many of these veterans are getting the homecoming they did not get when they came home the first time. And I thought, what is ahead for us? Man, there is a great homecoming. And 10,000 times 10,000 angels will be cheering for a single one of us who's uh, gathered with the wheat. And the heavenly host will be singing, worthy is the lamb. And we will bow down and we will wash our clothes in the blood of the lamb. We will say, amazing is what my God has provided for me. And some of us will come limping down the aisle, you know, from our own sin and our own weakness. And, and we'll wonder if we deserve to be there. But suddenly there'll be no more tears. And the limp will go away. And there won't be pain. And there won't be darkness. But there will be this. Just as the veterans were able to be welcomed by those whose security they had saved by their sacrifice, there will be some of us who will say, God, there's the bully that I witnessed to. And there's the daughter-in-law that I thought turned her back on everything that we cherished. And there's the boss I hated, but I tried to love for your sake. And God, you were, you were gathering in the harvest. And, and you didn't pull up the weeds too fast, but you planted me there. So thank you for welcoming me and, and growing the wheat where I thought there were only weeds around me. You were using me. Praise God. So teach me about the kingdom again, so that my testimony may be, he is good, and his kingdom is not yet, but it's already here. We rejoice in it, because he's gathering in a great harvest. Praise God. Father, so... Use us, we pray, to see the world not as the world can see it, but as Christ taught us, that he who would forgive us enables us by experiencing his heart to be his heart with a world that is being brought to its knees by deep need, but being given opportunity as we minister in that world. For these men and women who take your gospel out, would you give them encouragement and strength as they are assured of the kingdom come and live in that reality this day for Christ's sake, in whose name we pray, amen.